and welcome to this Blackboard Teaching Hospitals ultrasound video lecture. Before we dive into the presentation, I just wanted to give a little bit of a background and context to what this presentation was about. This was part of a focus symposium at the Physiotherapy UK 2020 conference, which was done virtually. And I was discussing the use of, or the potential use of thoracic ultrasound in the management of patients with blunt chest wall trauma. So I hope you enjoy the video. Don't forget to subscribe and keep an eye out for future video content. Hello, my name's Simon Hayward, and today I'm gonna to be talking about new concepts in the diagnostics and monitoring of the patient who has sustained blunt chest wall trauma. Particular diagnostics and monitoring technique I'm going to be talking about is thoracic ultrasound, sometimes termed lung ultrasound as well, but I will explain the difference between those two uh, right now. So for me, thoracic ultrasound kind of covers a lot more of the thoracic structures uh, than just the lung. It covers the thoracic wall, so your subcutaneous tissue, your intercostal muscles, and your ribs. It'll also include the pleura. So you two layers of the pleura, the parietal and the visceral. One is against the chest wall and the other surrounds the lung. So then you have the lung tissue as well. that You can investigate with ultrasound. And then the diaphragm to make sure there aren't any pathology or functional deficits around there. One thing I must say is that the use of ultrasound to examine the thoracic wall is relatively straightforward. But the diaphragm, there isn't any specific training program at the moment that allows you to bring diaphragmatic ultrasound into your scope of practice. It's something that I have written for one of the uh, ultrasound training programs in the UK, but that is something that is still under development. So the difference between thoracic ultrasound, in my opinion, and lung ultrasound, is where lung ultrasound just includes investigation of the pleura and the lung tissue itself. So when we have imaging modalities that we can use to monitor and investigate our patients who have suffered a blunt chest wall trauma. You have your chest x-ray, you have your CT scans, and if need be, MRI as well. But most of the time as physiotherapists, we'll be using these imaging modalities from the other disciplines, but we will have our real time assessment techniques that we want to use. So your observation, your palpation, auscultation, and percussion. So the real-time assessment techniques, you can do at the bedside, you can do them repeatedly before, during, after any intervention that you decide to implement and that is indicated with your patient. The other imaging techniques, they're a little bit difficult to do that. You know, you're not, very rarely you're going to get a chest x-ray immediately before and after a physiotherapy intervention and you're probably definitely never going to get a CT or MRI just for, those, for that purpose. Whereas lung ultrasound, being an imaging technique that is very portable, done at the bedside, no ionizing radiation can be done repeatedly in real time for you to analyze and make decisions as to what you're gonna do. You can scan while you're doing it and you can then scan again afterwards to make sure that your intervention is working. And if it's not, then adjust your treatment accordingly. So here is an image under ultrasound of the chest wall. You've got various layers and then superimposed onto this is an illustration of those structures. So ultrasound is a surface scanning technique where you scan through the skin, the dermis, adipose tissue, through the musculature, down to the ribs and beyond. So it's very good to visualize superficial structures. And then it can start to give you 
indication as about what's going on in those structures, in the pleural layer, and then into the lung tissue itself. When we scan the thoracic wall with ultrasound, what can we see? So one of the easiest things to spot, if you're scanning over the right place, and perhaps where the patient indicates that they have pain and there's erythema or contusion on the skin, you can quite easily see rib fractures. So on this image, this structure here is the rib, and you can see there's just a stepwise break in that rib. So there's one section of the rib just coming into view here, and then there's another lower section. And basically, you've got a stepwise break in that rib. So you can track these rib fractures quite easily. And when you do have rib fractures, you can also identify hematomas associated with those fractures. So in this image, we have one part of the rib there, the fracture line in the rib, and then the other part. And then this dark area here, just underneath the subcutaneous tissue and connective tissue layers, you've got a dark hematoma underneath. So you can track the size of those, make sure they're not getting worse, and hopefully they're resolving. You can also identify surgical emphysema. Now, because air is the enemy of ultrasound, ultrasound cannot penetrate air at all, surgical emphysema certainly interrupts any ultrasound scanning that you want to do. So what we have here is the subcutaneous tissue, and within that very irregular presentation is air, which means that everything below the ribs and the subcutaneous tissue which is holding the, the uh, emphysema is completely obliterated. So that is one limitation of thoracic ultrasound is that if you have surgical emphysema completely removes the, the possibility of imaging anything below. But with a little bit of gentle pressure you can push that air out of that section of tissue you want to scan through. Uh, so sometimes not always, but sometimes it is possible to scan below. Now, onto the pleura. Two pleural layers, one on thoracic wall, one on the outside of the lung. When these two are in contact, you get what's called lung sliding, where the two are actually gliding across each other normally and they shimmer. So in a pneumothorax, you've got a rib here and another rib here. And this is the pleural layer here. So on the left side of this, you can see that it's shimmering away. It's very subtle, but then on the right side, here's the pleural layer, but it's not shimmering. And what we've got here is the exact point between two ribs where the pleural layer on the left is in contact with each other, and on the right, they've separated. So you lose the lung sliding, which it's lost on the right hand side of this little image. So that is the lung point, and that is very, very specific for a pneumothorax. So if you're worried that your patient is compromised because of a pneumothorax, it is possible to use ultrasound to identify these. In addition, between the pleural layers, you can get bleeding, so hemothorax. So you can get a buildup of blood in the pleural layer, which will then, depending on the size of it, compromise the patient. So in this image we have the diaphragm with a spleen underneath and then this large black area here is the fluid filled pleural layers and in this particular case because it's a slight graininess to it we can potentially say that that's blood that is collected in the thoracic cavity and again you can monitor this this can and keep a track on how big this hemothorax is getting and whether it's the reason that your patient might be compromised. And then because we've had a thoracic trauma, we've had somebody that's potentially unwell, there's always the chance that you can develop pleural effusions as well. So again, in this image, we have the diaphragm spleen underneath. That's the aorta running through the image. This is a clear looking pleural effusion and this is the lower lobe completely compressed by that effect of the fluid pressure on it.
we've talked about thoracic wall ultrasound, we've talked about the pleural ultrasound, and now we can talk about the lung tissue itself. So in this image, again, we have the layer of the skin, and this time we can see this structure here. So this is a little bit of consolidation that we can identify in the lung tissue itself. So this is now below the pleura. So it's a peripheral consolidation. And in this situation, if it's next to a rib or the area of trauma, then chances are that's going to be a contusion. So that's a bruising bleeding into the alveoli structures here of the, uh, of the contusion itself. With the lung tissue, we can also identify atelectasis. So you've seen this image a couple of slides ago. So this time it's compressive atelectasis. So this is a fluid buildup, either from a pleural effusion, maybe hemothorax. So you know that this lung is compressed. This poor little lower lobe should be expanding, but it's completely solid and dense because all the air is being compressed and pushed out of it. You can also get atelectasis due to hypoventilation, maybe as a result of pain or flail chest. So you can identify these consolidations that you suspect are more atelectic than due to contusion. Um, finally, for the lung tissue itself, potentially some of the complications of blunt chest wall trauma may be a pneumonia. So you can track the development, development and hopefully resolution of these as well. So on this image, we have a diaphragm with the liver underneath this time. And what should be here is a very difficult to scan aerated lung. But in this image, it's completely dense. It almost looks like the liver itself. And that is a pneumonic consolidation of the lung tissue. Around it is a little bit of a pleural effusion as well, that dark black fluid as it appears on ultrasound is a paraneumonic effusion. So you can use the lung ultrasound to track these changes and identify perhaps what is the underlying cause of these consolidations that you might see. So the lung can become consolidated, which makes it easier to scan with lung ultrasound. But you need to decipher whether it's a contusion, atelectasis or pneumonia and potentially treat accordingly. And finally, we can talk about the diaphragm. So in this image, here is the diaphragm structure itself, this kind of U-shaped structure. And then on inspiration, it's heading towards the probe surface. On an expiration, it's heading away. So this, this image is being taken from underneath the ribs around the xiphoid process. So as the patient breathes in, the diaphragm descends towards the image. So it will be upside down in relation to what you, norm you normally expect. But you can see that if you had any worries, the diaphragm is compromised, that you could quite quickly use ultrasound of the diaphragm to identify whether that diaphragm is moving at all. You know, gross movements, how well functionally it's moving is a whole different situation. But at least you can identify, yes, that is moving to some extent. So I know it's not paralyzed at the very least. You can also use thickness of the diaphragm. So this is usually kind of tracking longer term problems. Maybe the blunt chest wall trauma is the beginning of a longer process that might be happening in the patient. But what tends to happen is you look at one layer of the diaphragm and two on ultrasound are quite easy to spot. And you're just measuring the difference between those two layers at a certain point in the respiratory cycle. And you can track this change over time. What is perhaps a bit more useful the thickening fraction so you again you do that same measurement and you do it at the beginning of diaphragm contraction and then midway through the contraction so you get that difference in the thickening so here is the diaphragm there's one layer of it and there's the second and you can see that this distance between the two just starts to thicken as the diaphragm contracts and there's the rib there and this is the pleural layer coming in. So that bright white line as it comes in is the pleura as it meets the diaphragm. But you can measure the diaphragm at different points to then work out how well it's functioning. Or in this case, you can see that it's thickening full stop. So that is a good sign that you don't have a paralyzed diaphragm at the very least. So what is kind of currently being used 
to assess blunt chest wall trauma with, with ultrasound. Some of the current things are identifying the complications as a result of blunt chest wall trauma, and then tracking the development of pathologies as they creep in, just to make sure that one, hopefully they're not happening, but two, if they are, that they're not compromising the patient too much, and then you're at least aware of them and can address them quickly if needs be. You can track those changes in the pathology. Hopefully it's improvement, but if it's deterioration, again, you're aware of that pathology in the first place, and you can start to make judgments about whether it's getting better or worse. Lung ultrasound is really quite useful to monitor lung aeration. So if you start to see a patient that is becoming compromised following their, their trauma, then lung ultrasound is one good way to not only identify the pathologies, but actually make some judgments about how well aerated that lung tissue is without necessarily having to expose the patient to too much radiation through other imaging techniques and can be done repeatedly as often as you see fit. And most importantly, evaluate the efficacy of your treatments that you want to instigate. That could be simple mobility, it could be recruitment, it could be see how well the lungs respond and how aerated they become once pain management is optimised. You can start to evaluate not only your own physio treatments, but also the, uh, the efficacy of treatments by other professionals. Pain control, pneumonia, with control with antibiotics, things like that. So this monitoring tool idea is quite powerful. A one-off ultrasound scan is never too useful on its own, but if you can see that there is a progressive deterioration in the condition of the lung, then perhaps you need to identify what that process is, or the leading process could be, and address that either as physiotherapists or within part of the multidisciplinary team. And then hopefully once something's instigated, you can monitor to track it back the other way. So you can have confidence that you are doing treatments that are benefiting your patient. And if they're not in the first instance, when you have expected it to have worked, then you can change accordingly. And what about the potential uses in the future? So I know that individuals like Kerry are very interested in identifying risk factors for these patient groups. So ultrasound can be really quite useful to identify small changes, subtle changes, small pathology within the chest wall, which could feed into larger risk factor methods of measuring. So then perhaps begin to prognosticate how badly this patient has been effective at an early time point to then make decisions about stratifying that patient to perhaps some level of intervention or support to start to make more or better informed decisions as to how to manage a patient at home in low level support within the hospital or higher level support because the prognostication is a little bit more accurate as to how this patient is probably going to progress through their following their trauma. So I hope you found that useful. There are certainly some areas of ultrasound that need more development, more research. I would love it to get to the point where physiotherapists can scan the thoracic wall, the lung, pleura and tissue itself and the diaphragm as one whole. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but certainly you can scan the pleura and the lung and the lung tissue through current training programs. So if you have any questions, do ask them at the uh, question session or feel free to email me or contact on Twitter via the, uh, the information on the screen. Thank you very much.